Hey folks, great to be with you on tonight's live stream. And if you could just give me a note, if you could hear everything okay, and then just let me know where you're watching from. I haven't done a Facebook live stream just uh, alone uh, outside the studio in a little while. So just wanna make sure you can hear me and see me clearly. And we'll give folks a few minutes to, uh, to join us. But as soon as you get in, just uh, post a note if you can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up and then just let me know where you're viewing from, all right? Wherever it is in America or in other countries, it'd be great to hear from you. And uh, this is going to be enlightening, eye-opening, helpful, edifying, and uh, hopefully I'll get to some of your questions too uh, because the particular meme I'm going to deal with won't take me that long to go through. I mean, it's it's another one of these things that's going viral and that's just it's it's just so wrong and I, look just about every day i'll see something posted and if it's about the bible there's there's gonna be something inaccurate or about hebrew or greek it's often inaccurate but when something just starts to go more viral and when a staff member sends me a note is there any truth to this and then another colleague sends me a note is there any truth to this and then I see another colleague posting it as if there is truth to it. But, you know, I haven't done one of these live streams in a bit and got some time to do it on this Saturday night. So wait a few more minutes as you come in and just looking. All right. Texas, te three straight from Texas, California. Uh, where else are you chiming in from? Australia. Boy, Texas is like leading the way tonight. What's, what's that about Texas? Um, all right. But hopefully uh, we're streaming fine and you're hearing me fine just going to give oh about two or three more minutes for more folks to join us here and and then i will get into this meme i just want to say that it's not my burden or my vision that i'm supposed to correct everything in the body right 99.9 percent .9 of what's happening in the church all around the world 99.99999 percent i don't know you don't know what's being taught from pulpits, what's being said in small groups, what's being written in every book, what's being posted on social media, et cetera, et cetera. So that's not my goal to track down every error. There's another error. But again, some things will come to my attention. Just like a few years back, I, I began to see one thing after another after another, the, the same quotes, the same statements. And I thought, okay, where'd these come from? Then traced them back to a particular book. And so, okay, this is all related to hypergrace. And, and I felt burdened to address it because the error was spreading. This is lesser in that it's just one meme, but it's typical of the kind of stuff that's out there. And because of my background in scholarship, bachelor degree in Hebrew, and then master's and PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures, when statements like this are made uh, completely false, I mean, the last line, which is basically unrelated, but the last line of the meme is correct. Basically, everything that goes before it is, is erroneous. So uh, glad to see you coming in from all over the country. And uh, I'm going to get started now. And I'm going to read this to you, okay? I'm going to read this meme to you. Um, there was a moment when Moses had the nerve to ask God what his name is. It, wasn't, it didn't take real nerve to do that. I mean, overwhelming in that holy presence, but it's a fair question. Make sure he's rightly representing him to the people of Israel. Uh, God was gracious enough to answer, and the name he gave is recorded in the original Hebrew as YHWH. Now, you have to understand something. Hebrew, just like other Semitic languages, Phoenician, Arabic, Aramaic, these languages are written for the most part without vowels. And when you are an experienced reader, you understand it. In other words, you say the vowels, you hear the vowels as you're reading in your head. The vowels are just not written. So, for example, if I wrote B, B the, the letters B and then another B, Netanyahu, you would say, oh, there are two I's, B, B, Netanyahu. Those who know my friend Bob Gladstone, my colleague Bob Gladstone, if I wrote B, B, Gladstone, you know there's an O there, right? So with Hebrew and Arabic uh, and Aramaic, Phoenician, these other Semitic languages, 
there are other things that indicate what vowels are, but to a great extent, you get used to it, reading without vowels. If you read a Hebrew newspaper there, you're reading it without vowels. You are saying the vowels, but the vowels are not written. So it's really important to understand. The vowels are there, they are understood, okay? But they're simply not written. So over time, we've arbitrarily added in an A and an E in there to get Yahweh, presumably because we have a preference for vowels. Oh, yes. Okay. Nobody arbitrarily added in anything. I'm, I'm looking at one scholarly theological dictionary. If I began to read from it within two or three minutes, there'd be nobody left in the room because it's so technical and detailed in linguistic analysis and how to vocalize Y-H-W-H, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey in Hebrew. But I'm looking at it's page after page after page after page after page and going to surrounding Semitic languages and going to background in Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible and, and on and on and on to explain why the vast majority of scholars today believe that the best way to vocalize this is Yahweh. So it is 100% false that, quote, we've arbitrarily added an A and an E. There is massive linguistic argumentation for it. And the, the revived argument that it was actually Yehovah or Yehovah has, has very little going for it. The one who's argued that best is Nehemiah Gordon. It really has very little going for it, but it is an academic position that some have held to. But the vast majority of scholars recognize that the, right, the most likely right pronunciation was Yahweh. But it's not because, well, we have a preference for vowels. It's because every word had vowels, even if they weren't written. It, it, look, when you're an English reader, you see the word circus. There are two C's in it, but you know one is su and one is ka. Who told you? Well, you learned it growing up. You see the word tough, T-O-U-G-H, and you know the G-H is an F sound. How do you know? You learned it growing up. You say the word women, and there's an O, but you pronounce it like an I, women, what, you learn it because that's how the language works, okay? So they see the word garage with two G's in it. And you know, the first one is a G and the second one is a J. You learned it. You learn how to pronounce things. So when you learn Hebrew, every word has vowels, but they were not written in the original text, but they were spoken and they were understood. But scholars and rabbis have noted that the letters yud hey vav hey yhwh represent breathing sounds or aspirated consonants. False. False. <sighs> it's, it's frustrating just because of the level of misrepresentation. People are like, oh, isn't that wonderful? I didn't know that. So even if I assume the person doing this is well-meaning, but they are, everything I've read so far that they've said is completely wrong except that the letters are Y-H-W-H in English, in Hebrew, yud hey vav hey. All right, so are these consonants, yud hey vav hey, Y-H-W-H, are they all aspirated consonants? No. What's an aspirated consonant? Okay, if I say b, p, f, those are aspirated. In order for me to say those consonants, I have to say that. That's not the case with the Y, with Yud. It's not the case with Wa. I can say Wa, We, Wa, but the B, P, F, D comes out a certain way. It's not the, it's not the way it is with, with, say, C, right, or J, or other consonants, or M, or N. So Y, H, W, H are not aspirated consonants. And the H at the end is, is a final vowel. It's not an aspirated consonant or final vowel sign telling you have a final sound of a eh or ah. So I, I, again, I, I wouldn't address this if not for the fact that it's so mind-bogglingly wrong, point after point after point. Okay, um, when pronounced without intervening vowels, it actually sounds like it's, it had vowels. Every Hebrew word has to have vowels. Every Hebrew word has vowels, but they are not 
written in the original system. They're written in later systems. And to repeat, to this day, if you're reading an Arabic newspaper or a Hebrew newspaper, you're reading it without vowels, and people can read it fine, just like someone reading English or German or some other language. <clears throat> so this, I guess the idea is that when Moses asked God his name, he went, <laughs> something like that. So it was allegedly unpronounceable, and then Moses is going to go back and tell Israel, so uh, he revealed himself to us. Who? I, I mean, it's it beyond boggles the mind. Yeah, inhale. So that, how do you get, look, the yes yeah sound is going out. It's not, it, it's beyond bizarre. So a baby's first cry, his first breath speaks to the name of God. False, false, totally false, completely bogus. First babies, their first sound is not, <laughs> their first sound, <clears throat> God help us with nonsense like this, getting traction. And now, you, you, look, here's the deal. If my video went totally viral, Richard, I'm not expecting millions of people to watch it, but if it went totally viral, it still wouldn't stop this from going out. And, and years from now, people will be quoting this if it was accurate, and, and, and people will be singing about it and preaching about it. A deep sigh calls his name, or a groan or gasp, but it's too heavy for mere words. False. It doesn't call his name. Now, a, a cry from the heart, God hears that. Groan, oh, God hears that when we're crying out, when we're groaning, when we're travailing, but we're not saying his name. Even an atheist would speak his name unaware that their very breath is giving constant acknowledgement to God. False. The fact they're breathing is only by God's grace, but they're not saying his name. <sighs> Moses asked God, God, what is your name? <sighs> what? <sighs> Go tell the children of Israel <sighs> has sent me to you. I mean, the fact is God says, Eheyeh, share Eheyeh. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. And Yahweh is a play on words, and it, it, it's, it's all clear in terms of what's going on here. Likewise, a person leaves this earth with their last breaths when God's name is no longer filling their lungs. So when I can't utter anything else, is my cry calling out his name. Being alive means I speak his name constantly. So it is heard, the loudest one and the quietest, and sadness we breathe heavy sighs and joy, our lungs feel almost like they'll burst and fear we heal. All this has nothing to do with the name of God. Zero, 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 zero. It has nothing to do with the name of God. And God gave a name and revealed himself to Moses in a way that would actually have meaning. And although we don't find this Hebrew form in the, in the Bible, we have it in other ancient Semitic languages, he could have been saying by the name Yahweh, I'm the one who brings things into existence. I'm the one who causes things to be. So allegedly every time you're breathing, you're calling out his name, bogus, false, nonsense of the highest order. Then it says, let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. And the final line, Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew means Yahweh says. That, the, one, the last line, that's correct. That's true. I'm not going to mention the name of the woman that, that posted that uh, initially or, or wrote it. But friends, I, I mean, what, what do we do with nonsense like this? And, and how does it even help? Why can't you simply say every time your heart beats, that's a reminder that an amazing creator made you. That's true. Every breath you take, that's only by God's grace. That's true. And when you can't find words, let the cry or sigh from your heart be your prayer. Amen to all of that. But to come up with this bogus stuff and then, wow, I never knew that, or is that beautiful? It's false. It is talking falsely. It is talking nonsense. Not in the overall scheme of things. It's hardly as dangerous as, as a lot of other stuff that's out there. But, but please, we, we got to... We got to do better. And, you know, just, just some good Bible software that links you to some good dictionaries will solve a whole lot of these problems and myths. Okay, I am going to answer some of your questions here. So if you have posted, so, so tell your friend, if you see this meme up, link it to this video, okay? Link it to this video. Uh, I, I got 
a tremendous amount of flack when I expose this, this false teaching that any Hebrew scholar would know is false teaching, that the original pictographic meanings of the letters still adhere in the text of the Hebrew Bible. So you look at the alleged original pictographic meaning of, of each letter, so Aleph, Oxhead, or Beit, uh, House, uh, et, et cetera, and you go through the various letters and now you can find you know, the whole gospel preached in the opening word of Genesis. It's, it's bogus, it's bogus, it's bogus. Our English alphabet is derived from the, the Roman alphabet, which is derived from the Greek alphabet, which is derived from the Phoenician alphabet, which goes back to pictographs before it became an alphabet. So we might as well do the same with English and say, let's go back to the original pictographic meaning. It's complete nonsense. But, but these become very sacred cows to people. And, and because they can read into the text all kinds of things that aren't there. And it becomes very dangerous. Once you say the words don't just mean what they mean, but there are all kinds of hidden meanings we find, now you are adding to the Bible or rewriting the Bible or recreating the Bible. But just by dealing with that, again, something that every Hebrew scholar you're going to talk to that's legitimate, legitimately knows Hebrew, of course they'll, they, they tell you that's, that's not true, that the pictographic meanings don't adhere. And the only ones that would try to get into it might be like a mystical rabbi trying to derive all kinds of meanings from things that aren't there. And we would, we would flee from the conclusions to which he would come. But before I answer your question, so if you haven't posted anything, go ahead and post some questions. I'll answer a few. But just a reminder, I'm just trying to see here about uh, sharing my screen. Ah, not, not important. Have you ordered yet, pre-ordered your signed numbered copy of The Silencing of the Lambs is due out the beginning of March, The Ominous Rise of Cancel Culture, and How We Can Overcome It. When I was writing this book, you can go to askdrbrown.org to, to pre-order sign every copy. It's a beautiful hardcover with a striking cover. So askdrbrown.org, you'll see it on the homepage, or, uh, or go to Dr. Brown Books if you want to order somewhere else. They'll give you links to, to all different places, drbrownbooks.com. You can read a sample chapter there as well for free. But when I was writing it, I really wanted to expose the, what's happening from big tech to college campuses to, to children's schools to it's it just a lot of shocking stuff, the attempt to cancel us and silence us. The, the Church of Jesus, the Messianic community of Jesus cannot be canceled and cannot be silenced. And the Word of God cannot be bound. So this book is not just eye-opening, but with strategy after strategy after strategy, including a special gospel holiday, which we'll be talking about, a special day where we will come out and make everyone know that we love Jesus and we are his followers. All right, um, let's just see here. I'm just going to scroll. Let's, let's see if I can just look at some of the comments here. Ah, all right, we won't mention your name, but guilty of posting that meme. Oops, no problem. Okay, uh, I was wondering if Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua or Yahshua. It is Yeshua. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have Yah in it is expected. When this is, this is a short form for Yehoshua uh, saves, okay? If, if you put it out in full, it would be Yehoshua Yoshia. But when things get abbreviated and, and put together, you do not preserve all the original sounds. Uh, and especially when the Yah is at, when the, the divine name is at the beginning, it, it is not preserved as Yah. So if you have the name Elijah Eliyahu, so the divine name is, is preserved there in a shorter form, or Yah in a shorter form. At the beginning, it, Yahu becomes Yeho, and then things shift over time, but in any case, Yeshua is definitely the right pronunciation. Yahshua never existed as that. That doesn't stop people from using it. And, and the ones that argue for that are the ones that, that don't know Hebrew well. That's why they argue for it. Um, uh, opinions on annihilationism. There is debate within the church and has been over the centuries about the nature of final judgment. In other words, there is dreadful judgment for those who reject God's mercy. There is something that we would not want to wish on anyone, and it should put a holy terror and fear inside of us. There has been debate over the centuries within the church as to whether that is eternal conscious torment 
or after some time of punishment, a final annihilation, so perishing rather than, than receiving eternal life. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those that kill the body but can't kill the soul, but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So this is a debate within the body. On the one hand, a positive argument in terms of witnessing to the lost about annihilationism is you don't have to endlessly defend, well, is it right for God to torture people forever and ever 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 for something that they just did in this world or if they never really heard the gospel and sometimes people won't even listen to you. What I always tell them is whatever God does will be perfectly just and in keeping with his character and he's merciful and compassionate and kind and perfectly just. On the flip side, many people lose their incentive to reach out when they think, well, you know, if the worst that happens is just they cease to exist, how bad can that be? So we cannot minimize future judgment. We cannot minimize that there's a dreadful fate, an irreversible fate for those who reject the gospel. But the debate over annihilationism versus eternal conscious torment is something that can be had within the body, and it's not a matter of, of, of heresy. Um, Howard, how can you be so confident that the Tetragrammaton is pronounced Yahweh? We can be very confident, but not 100%. For sure it had vowels. For sure the meme is nonsense. For sure the meme is linguistic, philological nonsense of the highest order, of the most absurd order, even though it's trying to make a, a nice point. Um, we have many reasons to say it was not Yehovah or Yehovah. Many reasons to say that. And the best argument is that it was Yahweh. There's a lengthy discussion in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. I believe it was M.P. O'Connor that penned that part. But you dig in there and you'll get all of the philological and textual reasons for that argument. We can't be 100% confident, which doesn't bother me, in, in that God himself is, is shrouded in glory and mystery and transcends our understanding. But he has revealed himself, and, and that is the... the the great majority of Hebrew scholars and, and Semitic philologians believe that's the best pronunciation. Um, let's just see here. Uh, any thoughts on the names Nahum and Nehemiah in relation to breathing or sighing? Um, yeah, I, I don't know why that would really be an issue. It, in, in other words, the, the roots from which they come, the root uh, Linachem, um, to, to comfort, etc. It, it's it's an actual it's it's an actual root. So these names would have actual meaning. You know, Nehemiah could theoretically be comforted by uh, by Yahweh. There are other meanings to Linachem as as well. Uh, but Hebrew is filled with with guttural sounds, ch and ha. So what may sound like breathing to us is is really is really not there. Um, let's see. Tony, what are your brief thoughts on the major claims of black Hebrew Israelites? Ridiculously bogus. However, there's no question that there were Israelites in Africa over the centuries, uh, Israelites slash Jews, and a good argument could be made that there were slaves who came over to America from Africa who in their background uh, still had Jewish custom or practice so the fact you have the Ethiopian Jews recognized by Israel or the Lemba tribe from Zimbabwe, which actually has some priestly uh, DNA from, from what we know. Um, so from what I understand, the origins of the black Hebrew Israelites came out of these uh, black congregations, African-American congregations or groups in America that claimed to have, have roots all the way back to ancient Israel, which they may well have. Uh, and then through intermarriage, you know, just like, like I'm, I'm a white Jew, right, Caucasian Jew, that's through intermarriage, people marrying into Judaism from the other cultures. So you have Chinese Jews, African Jews, uh, American Jews, we're around the world. And then out of that, the false teaching that all Africans or all blacks originally go back to the different tribes of Israel, that's completely bogus, so that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. There are all kinds of bizarre legalism and things like that. Um, let's just see here. Um, okay, just looking at some other 
Uh, Dr. Brown, I have a question. Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Does God the Father have a holy name that can be said and should be respected or no? Uh, yes, but it, it's not so much the pronunciation of the name. Because as far as we know, at that time, even by the first century, Jews would not pronounce the name because it was considered too sacred. We have indications of this in the way some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are written, where Yahweh's name would be written in, in a different script, or there'd be a few dots in front of it, suggesting that, that you're being alerted, there's the name, don't say it. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, we, some of the earliest Septuagint manuscripts may differ here, but otherwise the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation said, Kurios, Lord, just like uh, today uh, a Jewish person would say Adonai, which, which is Lord rather than, than God's name. Uh, so it wasn't so much the pronunciation, but, but who he is and, and honoring and reverencing his character, his power, his nature, so that even when we speak of the God of the universe, so the creator, that there is reverence attached to that. And the Lord's Prayer will be answered when the whole world uh, will bow down before him in reverence and honor him after the destruction of the wicked when he is, he is worshipped as, as God. Um, let's just see here. Yeah, David, the whole pictographic no nonsense, and this is supposedly the decade of the mouth and, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's scroll down, see if there are a few other questions I'll get to, but circulate this to your friends and let's just combat error with truth. A again, I don't do this all the time. I, I don't... Um, I don't make an effort to correct everything I see. In fact, a quick story. So it was around 1984, 1985, and uh, I was attending a Wednesday night service at a local church on Long Island, Pentecostal church, and there was a woman speaking that night, a guest that the pastor had come in, and as she's giving an account about the, the spies going into the land, the 12 spies, and bringing back a bad report, and she's getting a lot of the biblical details wrong. And I'm getting frustrated be, because I see the guy next to me taking, pouring with notes. And I'm thinking, I want him to nudge him, like, buddy, but look at this verse, or check this out, or go over here. So I'm just it's getting annoyed. But as she went on, the overall point she was making was, was, a, was a really good point, an edifying point. And you could tell that the people were getting blessed by the point. And right then, I, I felt God gently saying to me, right now, all around America, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pastors preaching behind their pulpits. Wednesday night services were much more common back then. And, and all around the world, there are others teaching the word. And, you can't be there to fix everything. So chill, chill. And, and God's, God's not stopping everybody. When, when, when one guy's saying there's a pre-trib rapture, another's saying there's a post-trib rapture, another's saying there is no trib, and another's saying that tongues are for today, and another's saying tongues are not for today, and one is saying we're, we're predestined by God's choice, another said we're predestined by God's foreknowledge. God's not, God himself is not intervening to stop everything, Right? If it was me, you'd be like, well, everyone who doesn't say it exactly, I mean, fix it all. But, but none of us have perfect knowledge either. None of us have perfect revelation. So we agree on the majors. If you're outside these majors, we say you're outside the faith, right? And, and then within the body, we try to sharpen each other and learn from each other. So I love digging deep and doing my best to teach and preach the word accurately. You know, I did a show the other day, I'll probably write on it, who appointed me the gatekeeper of the charismatic church? I've had critics say that. Well, you're the gatekeeper of the charismatic church. That's how they look at me. So it's my job, basically, to be studying with the latest area here, the latest issue here, watch the TV preachers, watch this, and then constantly correcting, calling out, labeling this one as false teacher. God didn't call me to do that. When he burdens me about something, I address it. When something comes to my attention repeatedly and I feel I'm supposed to address it, I do. And a lot of it is in Pentecostal charismatic circles because I travel so widely there, but it's just not there. There are other issues that concern me as well. And, and whatever place you put me, if I was a Southern Baptist, I, I'd be dealing with issues in our own midst more. If, if I was a charismatic Lutheran, I'd be dealing with more issues there, right? If I was only in the Messianic Jewish movement, I'd be dealing with more issues there. But I, I'm not God's policeman. 
and you're not God's policeman. And if you think that your whole ministry is just to fix everybody else, well, how about starting with fixing yourself? You know, Smith Wigglesworth once said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you think you have the gift of discernment, use it on yourself for six months and you'll never discern anything about anybody else for a long time. Yeah, that's a, a paraphrase. A theme, are tattoos from God or Satan? Well, certainly if the imagery is satanic, if the message is satanic, if it's you know, creepy and demonic and anti-God and anti-Christ, well, then it's from below, not from above. I have colleagues who've really studied demonology and studied tattoos that are convinced that all tattoos are of the devil. There's only one reference to it in the Bible, Leviticus 19. Uh, and if, if you're going to take that and say that that must be for to, you know, a, a prohibition for today, well, then what about many other prohibitions in Leviticus that were just for ancient Israel, as opposed to the morality prohibitions, like prohibitions against adultery and homosexual practice, which are for all peoples and all times. So I could not get a tattoo in good conscience. I have Christian friends who have, and maybe have a scripture verse, or that's between them and God. I couldn't do it in good conscience. Uh, it, when we had our ministry school, many students came in with tattoos. We said, hey, while you're in school, just don't get any more. And then the rest, in, after that's between you and God. Uh, but I'm not going to make the demonic stat statement that all tattoos are of the devil. I just couldn't do it myself. Uh, any thoughts on the movie, The God Who Speaks, about the canon of Scripture in 66 books of the Bible? It was put together by American Family Films. Uh, I did the, uh, I hosted their documentary on the image of God. If you haven't seen it, In His Image, uh, you just go over to YouTube and type in In His Image, the movie, and it's free to watch there and been watched on other sites hundreds of thousands of times. Very, very powerful. Uh, help you understand the era of transgender issues and God's plan for humanity and, and the uh, answers to, to those of same-sex attraction. So it's, it's powerful, well done. So the God Who Speaks, they did earlier. And um, yeah, that's, that's very, very well done. I didn't watch all of it. I, I may not have watched all of it, but yeah, very, very well done with some, with some good scholars. Where can I buy the hoodie I'm wearing? Well, I guess it's Fire School of Ministry gear. Um, but I'm not sure if we're still selling it. Well, we got a sufficient donation to, to, uh, to help starving kids in, uh, overseas. One of the ministries we support, we'll, we'll sell it uh, some line. Um, Scotty, cessation or open, cautious, continuous, which is more biblical? Well, open, cautious, continuous is more biblical, but I don't see that as biblical either. Cessationism is certainly not biblical. I'm 100% dogmatic on that scripturally and then watching what God's doing around the world secondarily. Uh, but why, if the Holy Spirit's moving and you're embracing the Holy Spirit, why be so cautious? Why, why, why be cautious? Do you put a seatbelt on in terms of how much you love Jesus? Do you put a seatbelt on in terms of how much you love the word? Do you put a seatbelt on in, in terms of your burden for the lost? Why put a seatbelt on with the Holy Spirit. So biblical is embracing. Um, it, it is embracing the, um, uh, the gifts and power of the Spirit for today and saying, Father, you're the one who pours it out. We rejoice. Yeah, Bruce, I answered the question. If Jesus' name means Yah saves, it, 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 it is not Yah saves. If it was Yah saves and you wanted to say it like that, it would be Yah Yoshia. You, you can't just put words together like that. When words get put together, they get shortened, okay? They get shortened, they get abbreviated, like Mike versus Michael, what happened to the L? Or Dick versus Richard, okay? If Dick is short for Richard, where's the R? And where did the K come from? And where did the H go? And where did the D go? And the, so when names get shortened, everything changes. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds examples of, of that. Is the rapture a man-made idea? The idea of a pre-trib rapture where we're taken out uh, seven years before the actual second coming, yeah, that's, that's not scriptural, although many sincere people hold to it. So wherever it came from or whoever initially felt that's what scripture taught, they didn't get it from God. They didn't get that from God. Um, does the Holy Spirit live in us or is he upon us and dies? He leaves us, comes back to us when, does he leave us, come back to us and need it? Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. 
and the Holy Spirit lives in us. Jesus told us that would happen. He was with the disciples, but will be in us. So even though he's spirit, we're talking about physical bodies, that's how it's explained in Scripture. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the immersion of the Holy Spirit, he comes upon us in power and drenches us in his power to use us for his gifts, uh, for his purposes. Um, uh, Hallett, hey, Dr. Brown, being flooded with Torah observing Christians these days who say you need to be Torah observing to be saved. What scripture can I use to combat this? Just, just really take time to break down Galatians verse at a time. They'll have other interpretations for it, but just push, just push, just push back to expose the, the level of error involved. And then go through Hebrews 7 through 11, just verse for verse for verse, and point to the change that had to come with the new and better covenant. Um, ben, is QAnon going to save us all? Yeah, it's, it's crazy that people still believe in this stuff. But one of my biggest surprises in the last few years is when I had a scholar come on who had written a book, James Beverly, about QAnon, and I began to talk about it. People were flipping out on our Facebook page. I may have lost, between that and calling out the false prophecies about Trump, we probably went from 590,000 followers on the S. Dr. Brown Facebook page to 580,000. Just boom. Uh, you talk about evidence that the following was a cult-like following. Uh, that's, that's a whole other subject I, I, won't, get, I won't get into. Um, <clears throat> let's just see here. Have you looked into Orthodox Christianity? They make a case they follow Old Testament worship for the New Covenant. I haven't delved into Orthodox Christianity in depth, uh, but to me, everything is tested by Scripture. Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, Protestants, we all agree that Scripture is supreme. So Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic would claim to have inspired tradition that goes along with Scripture, but we would all have to agree if the tradition contradicts Scripture, then we throw the tradition out. So I go back to Scripture on everything. I'm sure there are many beautiful practices in, in Ortho, Eastern Orthodoxy as there are in Roman Catholicism and then things I blatantly differ with, especially within Roman Catholicism. Uh, let's just see if there are any other comments here. Um, okay. So remember, if you haven't pre-ordered The Silencing of the Lambs yet, do it. And, and hey, can I just ask for a quick favor? If you've been blessed by any of the books that I've written, uh, over 40 now by God's grace, if they've been a blessing to you, tell a friend. Do a, a quick little post holding up the book, and then take a minute to, to post a review on Amazon. It's, it's where a large number of people order books, and I'm influenced by reviews of products I don't know, or books I don't know. I, I want to find out and I, if I see the thing has got you know, 800 reviews and 600 are negative, okay, that's going to make me wonder about it. And, and I'll look at some of those. Uh, and we'll often have people that don't like me that just post bogus reviews to attack. <laughs> you read them think, oh, you got to be kidding me. But if you have been blessed, uh, and, and our reviews are overwhelmingly positive, which, which we're so glad to see, but, but go ahead and post a review. And again, if you haven't yet ordered, pre-ordered, and you can still do it, a signed numbered copy of The Silencing of the Lambs, which you'll find to be eye-opening and then very inspiring. Go over to askdrbrown.org. Before you get off tonight, askdrbrown.org. You'll see it there right on the home page. And let's just see. I'm going to look at a few. Ben, my wife is reading one of your books on homosexuality. Helpful in info. So glad to hear that. Rhonda, thank you. Dr. Brown, for our hands are stained with blood and go and send them more. Great books. Um, let's just see. Angie, what is your favorite David Wilkerson story? Uh, hmm. Boy. Uh, probably the, the most dramatic. I wasn't there to see it. But it was, a, it was on a Sunday night before what's called Black Monday, the big stock market crash. And David Wilkerson was preaching at Times Square Church on a Sunday, the day before Black Monday, and said, if you want to see history made tomorrow, join me in front of Wall Street tomorrow. And he was there, said, said the collapse was coming, and it came. That was, that was fairly dramatic. But 
as much as I spent time with him, had, you know, just a meal, the two of us in a restaurant, would talk with him often one-on-one before or after a church service, um, I never felt totally relaxed about it. It was, it was not his fault, but I used to say it was like fellowshipping with a razor blade. He'd just say, so how are you doing? I was like, I'm clean, everything's good. I mean, he just kind of looked right through you. I mean, he trusted me with his pulpit, I don't know, maybe 50 times. So we had that good relationship. I'd preach and he wasn't even there. And, uh, but in fact, here, I'll, I'll tell you one story and then, then maybe I'll run. Uh, <clears throat> so we were, as many, many years ago, this is, oh, early 90s, 92, 93, something like that. And we had shared offices, uh, our, our ministry with our school and with, with some others. And we felt, okay, we just need to have a little, little extra room here in just our own offices, just, just, you know, 30 or 40 feet outside in the parking lot over. So in the same general buildings. But I was going to need extra money to pay the rent. And it was, you know, we, we were not bringing in a lot of money in those days. I mean, to this day, compared to other ministries, we don't bring in a lot, but God blesses us and the money's used uh, to reach many, many, many in, in many ways. But then it was much, much tighter. So I'm, I'm praying before a service at Times Square Church, and I'm going to be sharing the word. And if you came into the building before the church service, you could hang out in the vestibule and talk, but once you walked into the main building, it would be the sanctuary there was just prayer going on before the service started, so there was, there was no talking. So I'm at the altar praying, and I, I, we had previously gotten a $10,000 gift, which in those days was a lot, a lot of money. We'd gotten a $10,000 gift from uh, another ministry. They had sold property, and they were dividing certain things up, and the board recommended that our ministry got some. So we had a $10,000 gift. So I'm at the altar, and I'm saying, God, you know that if we just had that now, that would really give me a sense of confidence moving forward because we'd have rent for some months and it would just give us a little cushion. But I didn't want to specifically ask God for $10,000. So after the service, or during, at some point, David Wilkerson looks over to me and he says, how are things with your finances? And I said, um, good. I mean, we're okay. We're fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. Then a little bit later, he says, you're you're sure things are okay with your finances? I said, well, um, well, yeah, I mean, we have some needs. We're praying about it. God will meet our needs. And finally he looks at me and he says, well, 10,000 do. And I said, brother, I said, brother Dave, I can't believe it because that's the exact amount I was asking for before the service, but I didn't want to say the words to God. Lord, we need $10,000. He goes, next time be more specific. It'll be easier for me to hear. <laughs> so that was, that was Brother Dave. But I mean, uh, sometimes he would just begin to preach and uh, instantly my heart would burn because of the prophetic burden in, in his heart. All right, listen, friends. Uh, I am going to sign off here, but share this video with others uh, post it on your pages, and uh, at least let's, let's put to rest this silly myth, and let's honor uh, the Lord God of all as he should be honored. God bless you.